Good afternoon, everyone. Good morning or good evening, depending on where you're following us today. Uh, welcome to our panel number three on slabs in Brazil, Colombia, Mexico, and the United States. It's a, it's a pleasure to, to be here with you and uh, to be chairing this very interesting session on this amazing conference organized by Justice for Journalists and the Foreign Policy Center. Thanks for the invitation. We've got four amazing speakers with us this afternoon. But before I give them the floor, I just wanted to uh, introduce uh, the subject in Latin America and also Media Defense, uh, where I work. Uh, Media Defense is an organization based in London whose aim is to provide legal defense to journalists and the press when they're sued or in order to advance uh, international standards on freedom of expression. We have a program that supports uh, journalists' defense. We cover the costs of a, a lawyer, for instance, for journalists who need support. And we also engage in strategic litigation, trying to advance standards around the world. So if you've been sued or if you're having uh, problems because of your work as a journalist, you know, we might be able to help. Now on to, on to our session. Uh, what I think is different in Latin or special in Latin America uh, is the fact that slaps happen in a different context, a context of violence, of harassment and physical threats and violence against activists and uh, journalists for many decades. Um, it's widely known that Latin America is one of the most uh, dangerous and violent regions of the world both for journalists and for human rights defenders. Many organizations and UN bodies have documented this. And in this context, slaps are just a more sophisticated or less violent um, tool that um, is being used lately uh, to try and censor or harass those who are dealing with public interest issues, um, denouncing corruption, violence, human rights violations, or even reporting critically about businesses and um, politicians and governments. Um, in this session this afternoon, we've, we're very proud or very pleased to have two first-hand victims of slaps uh, in the Americas. We've got uh, with us Morgan um, Simon. She's a journalist and also uh, an investor. Uh, she's the founder of the Candid Group, and she's been sued because of her reporting on a matter of public interest uh, in the United States. She, the litigation is still ongoing and she'll tell us a bit more about it later. Uh, after Simon, uh, Morgan, uh, we'll have uh, João Paulo Cuenca. João Paulo is a Brazilian writer and filmmaker who has been sued more than a hundred times uh, because of a tweet critical to the current uh, Brazilian president. And after the interventions from these two very, um, very important people, we have uh, two interventions by representatives of two of the leading uh, organizations in Latin America who have been documenting and researching on SLAPs over the years. Uh, we have uh, Pedro Cardenas from Article 19 in Mexico. He's a protection coordinator there. And we also have Juan Pablo Madrid Malo, who's the coordinator of the Center for the, Stud for the Studies on Freedom of Expression of the famous FLIP, Fundación para la Libertad de Prensa in Colombia, probably one of the most important uh, uh, freedom of expression NGOs in Latin America. Um, the way this panel is organized, and I think throughout the conference, we'll have a, a five minutes, six minutes introduction by each of the panelists. And after that, uh, we'll have a Q&A session. I'll introduce a few questions and we'll have questions also from the audience. So if you want to uh, ask any questions to the panelists, please send the questions through and I'll read them um, after their initial introduction. So thank you very much to the organizers again. Uh, welcome, everyone. And I give the floor then to Morgan Simon, please. Um, and I figured that that was apt in terms of what it's like uh, to be party to a slap suit. Um, uh, 
So just to give the background, my profession is that I'm actually an impact investor. I make investments into companies and funds that have a social and environmental focus. And the idea is that we get to really build the world that we want to see. Um, and at the same time, we're acknowledging all the historic harms that money has tended to cause towards communities um, and, and often corporate actors as a part of that. So even though most of my day is really supporting the positive stuff in the world, we also need to fight back against instances where money and corporations are causing harm. And we like to support social movements and how we do it. Um, so when the family separation crisis was hitting in the United States, I presume this is a story that people are familiar with. It's one of the most, to me, embarrassing chapters of US history. The idea that as families were coming seeking refuge in the United States, that their children were taken away from them and put into incarceration and the parents as well. And there were for-profit companies making money, making hundreds of dollars a night per migrant in their care in often prison-like conditions. Um, and that was something that caused a lot of outrage from people across the country. And activists came together trying to follow the money, essentially, of who was funding these private prisons. And we realized that all of us are. And when I say all of us, knowing this is a global audience, it's because when you put your money in the bank, right, often you don't know really where your money is spending the night. And it gets loaned out to companies all over the world. So for instance, if you were banking with Barclays or uh, Wells Fargo, Bank of America, Chase, um, these banks were all part of funding the private prisons that were profiting from family separation. So a coalition of us came together. We were part of organizing over 500,000 people across the country to do 500 in-person action at banks, um, hundreds and thousands of petitions and letters and phone calls of people saying, we do not wanna make money for our family by locking up someone else's family. And with that, we were extremely successful in convincing banks close to 90% of the finance uh, represented in the private prison industry to stop financing these harmful contracts um, and essentially to help ensure that consumer money was not going to be used to support horrendous practices like family separation. I was writing about these campaigns on Forbes.com, um, where I serve as a senior contributor. We're a network of experts, essentially, that write about what we know. Um, and certainly, I knew by that point a lot about private prison finance. Um, so I wound up getting sued for defamation, uh, both myself personally and my company, Candide Group. And essentially, the, the key statement that they took issue with was my having said that prisons separate families. And I, I don't know if you all have ever seen a prison, um, but essentially, right, the idea that when someone is locked up, they are de facto separated from their family, whether it's in the context of the criminal justice system or the immigration system. Um, and from that perspective, it was a ridiculous claim, and that's why a judge ruled in our favor. Um, however, the private prison company has appealed. It means that it's still an active lawsuit. It's still something that we have to fight every day. Um, and what's really really upsetting to me is knowing at a time where there are still about 500 um, children that are separated from their families, right, that I would need to spend any time fighting this lawsuit as opposed to just focusing on advocating for those children and families. So that's where it's been a really interesting lesson for us in terms of learning how corporations use these sorts of lawsuits to really try to distract attention from the issues, to try to run away from the truth and the truth about the harm that they've caused people. Um, and luckily in my case, it's just civil, right? It's not criminal. Um, and knowing um, per the Business and Human Rights Report of over 350 slap suits they found, particularly in the Global South, of how often criminal charges are a part of that picture as well. Um, so I think it's really important for people to know more about these sorts of lawsuits, for legal firms to commit to not defend corporations who are doing this sort of terrible practice, and to as much as possible provide pro bono support to activists who generally will never have the same types of financial resources that companies do. You know, just the CEO of this prison company makes more in a year than my entire net worth, right? Uh, it's a very, very uh, unequal fight.
that we have going on here. Um, and then the final message, you know, whatever issue you may care about, always follow the money story. Essentially knowing that whatever harm is happening, someone is financing it. You know, someone is impacting your issue and it might be that you are actually the one financing it, whether through your bank account or your pension fund or your alma mater, if you're not really paying attention to where your money is spending the night. So there's more recent resources on that. Um, um, and happy to share uh, more information uh, at Morgan Simon One is my Twitter and Instagram handle, and I'm always happy to be in touch with people who are interested in learning more about the money story behind their issue. Um, and then, in terms of this legal case, all of the information on our slap suit is on CandideGroup.com/activism, and Candide is C-A-N-D-I-D-E. Um, it's a Voltaire novel that's about battling the forces of good and evil, and I think that's what we really feel that we're doing every day in impact investment. Um, so thank you so much for spending your time with us today and look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Morgan. That was, that was uh, extraordinary. Uh, in, a, in a very short video, you managed to uh, almost draw exactly what's the effect of, of a, a slap lawsuit for an activist or a journalist. It, it basically prevents you from doing your work, pre prevents you or stops you from uh, doing the public interest work you're trying to do and uh, bring the word out. Uh, instead, you spend your time and resources defending yourself. So thank you very much for sharing your experience and uh, we'll, we'll come back to that in the question time. Uh, I particularly, particularly like um, what you suggest of more offer of pro bono support to activists, and I would add journalists as well. We see that that is missing around the world. It's something that Media Defense uh, provides, but uh, given the, the huge um, number of cases around the world uh, of, of frivolous lawsuits, criminal and civil, as you mentioned, against journalists, that is something sorely missing. Um, now we'll go through to the, our next speaker, João Paulo Cuenca. As I mentioned, he's a writer and filmmaker from Brazil, and uh, he will tell us about his current experience, which is also ongoing, of being sued multiple times in all over Brazil. Thank you. Greetings, everyone. My name is João Paulo Cuenca, and in June last year, I read that the federal government spent 30 million reais on radio and TV stations owned by evangelical pastors who support President Jair Bolsonaro of Brazil. And before I went to make a coffee, I posted in Twitter, on Twitter, in quotes, the Brazilian will only be free when the last Bolsonaro is hanged in the guts of the last pastor of the Universal Church. For satire purposes, I paraphrased a very well-known 18th century saying attributed to the Enlightenment scholars Voltaire and Diderot, but authored by the French abbot Jean Mislier. Men will never be free until the last king is strangled with the entrails of the last priest. Originally about kings and priests, the phrase has had several incarnations in the last almost 300 years. It's a cliche appropriated by anarchists, liberals, anarcho-capitalists, environmentalists, people on the left and on the right. My favorite is not any of these, but another, graffitied on the streets of Paris in May 1968. And after strangling the last bureaucrat in the guts of the last socialist, socialist, we will still have problems. Anyway, the chaos quickly ensued in my social networks with threats of physical violence and lawsuits in every inbox. And not to mention a quick and very successful smear campaign that resulted in my dismissal by Dosha Vela Brazil, for which I wrote a column. All of that is the product of a very well-oiled social technology consolidated with Bolsonarism here in Brazil. What we call here gabinetes do ódio, hate offices driven by federal lawmakers and their bots, quickly detect targets and set out to attack. This is a relatively effective and cheap mechanism of psychological coercion and social censorship. The aim here is to make a distant voice impossible. And this time, Brazilian neo-fascism 
had the complicity of a German public company, Deutsche Welle. They, under pressure uh, from the Brazilian government, fired me and published a lying note attributing me a crime I did not commit, hate speech. Those who untruthfully accused me of calling for the hanging of the president seem to have difficulties understanding what a metaphor is. The metaphor present in Ms. Lee's sentence, the church and the nobility or other familias like it should keep away from Republican power for the sake of the people. That Deutsche Welle lying note brought the attention of Bolsonaro's family and Universal Church. They used it many times as propaganda for their purposes. And in a direct consequence of that, 143 Universal Church pastors until now claiming moral injury have sued me in remote court houses around Brazil. Their strategy is to sue me in different parts of the country, so I have to defend myself in all those corners of a continent-sized nation. They want to still fear in future critical voices and drive me to ruin or madness. Above all, this is about setting an example. With the support of media defense, for which I'm very grateful, I have now a team of lawyers in Rio and Sao Paulo helping me navigate in this absolute litigation, a coordinate action driven by the church. I believe this case goes way beyond my satirical tweet. This lawfare against writers and journalists is becoming the new normal everywhere, and our legal systems need urgently to create rules and protection to prevent their misuse. Many thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Cuenca, for, for your presentation. Um, your case is uh, uh, really incredible. Uh, 143 lawsuits, both criminal and civil lawsuits, um, all over Brazil, except in the very state where you live in Brazil. So uh, it was clearly an attempt and a strategy uh, by the Universal Church to um, create problems for you to harass and effectively bankrupt you. If you have to, to go to every, every one of these uh, courthouses to defend yourself as you're expected to do according to Brazilian law, um, you, you would be impossible for you to do anything else but to work on your defense. Uh, also, thank you for mentioning the, the, the term lawfare, as this is uh, used in some parts of, of Latin America, is as a synonym, I think, to slap and or judicial harassment, effectively the misuse of the legitimate um, legal mechanism, judicial mechanisms, uh, in order to harass activists and journalists. So I think we'll talk a little bit more about this in our questions um, after the four presentations. So now going to our second part of the, of the panel, we've heard from two um, activists, an activist and a writer who are being sued um, for their publications, for their work. And now we'll hear first from uh, Juan Pablo Madrid Malo, works at FLIP in Colombia who have been working on SLAPs, researching and documenting and campaigning uh, for the implementation of legislation in Colombia uh, that will prevent these uh, types of lawsuits. So, Juan Pablo, you have the floor. Good evening. I am Juan Pablo Madrid Malu, coordinator of the Center of Studies on Freedom of Expression at Fundación para la Libertad de Prensa, FLIP which is a non-government organization dedicated to defend freedom of expression and the right to information for citizens in Colombia. I am now going to read my initial remarks about the topic that has us reunited today, SLAPS. For several years, we have been monitoring how the judicial system in the country is used by several actors to put pressure on journalists who speak out about issues of public concern. This, of course, brings to attention the topic that we are today discussing, strategic lawsuits against public participation. First of all, a conceptual acclaration. 
if you check out, check out our internal documentation, you will find that this form of censorship is named as judicial harassment. But this term is interchangeable with slaps. There are several ways in which journalists are slapped in Colombia. We have documented civil lawsuits which seek for monetary retribution under the figure of extra-contractual responsibility, giving a damage to the plaintiff's reputation. Criminal proceedings attending to insult and slander and the utilization of the constitutional figure known in Spanish as acción de tutela meant to protect fundamental rights under our constitution. In these cases, plaintiffs seek protection to the rights of intimacy, honor, and good name. In some cases, journalists face various lawsuits at once. Although we have several cases in which the plaintiff is a state actor, I'm going to focus on some cases where the plaintiffs are non-state actors as examples to understand how slabs operate in Colombia. The first example is the case of journalist Juan Pablo Barrientos, who has published two different books compiling his investigations on pederasty within the Catholic Church. The journalist has faced over a dozen lawsuits seeking for the books to be unpublished. In 2009, when Barrientos published his first book, book, a judge granted an absurd precautionary measure, which ordered the publisher to stop the printing and distribution of the book. This measure was promptly lifted, but it exemplifies the consequences of slaps on public debate. Barrientos has had to defend in the stance his work on multiple occasions. This undoubtedly impacts his freedom of exercising journalistic investigations. Another example involves famous movie director Ciro Guerra, who sued journalists from the media outlet Volcanicas after they published an investigation which held him responsible for various sexual harassment cases. Constitutional actions were brought against the journalists. He also started a criminal case and, finally, Guerra sought monetary retribution for a million dollars in a civil lawsuit. Civil cases tend to be very debilitating for journalists in Colombia, as they take a longer time and, of course, monetary resources to defend themselves. Additionally, it also implies an enormous economic pressure in, in this case, paying a million dollars for publishing a story on sexual harassment. This case also opened discussions on protection to journalistic sources, as judges often ask for confidentiality to be lifted to prove the claims within the stories. Lastly, there is a particular lawyer in Colombia, Abelardo de la Espriella, who has sued several journalists in Colombia for different reasons. He sued journalist Cecilia Orozco for an opinion article in which she referred to him with a mocking term depicting him as a ridiculous character. He sought about $10,000 arguing that his reputation and good name was damaged because of the journalist article. These cases are only a few of hundreds that we have documented over the past years. In some cases, they are successful in silencing or intimidating journalists, especially those in regions which may be less protected. At often times, slaps are just one of the elements trying to censor journalists. These are sometimes accompanied by threats and smear campaigns. Slaps generate in Colombia, as in the rest of the world, a chilling effect on freedom of expression. They constitute a particular form of censorship as they use the legitimate, legitimate tools that the state provides to protect citizens' rights to silence public debate. In Colombia, there have been recent discussions in the Congress about an anti-slap law, however, it has not been discussed with the urgency it deserves. Thank you. Thank you very much, Juan Pablo, for, for your presentation. Uh, it's uh, interesting that you, again, just as uh, João Paulo Cuenca, you mentioned the issue of smear campaigns and uh, online harassment and threats against journalists, uh, which usually are combined with a, with a slap. Um, strategy. Um, interesting, uh, as a second point, the case of Juan Pablo Barrientos, is, it's a good example of what's happened, what happens in other countries in South America. For instance, journalist Paulo Gas in Peru is also being sued by the Catholic Church, by, by a sect of the Catholic Church, 
um, for a book she wrote uh, denouncing um, crime committed by that specific uh, grouping. Uh, we're, we're helping her just as, as we're helping Las Vulcanicas um, face the lawsuits that um, they're facing at the moment, uh, uh, initiated by Ciro Guerra. Um, lastly, we'll come to, um, well, I'll ask you later, Juan Pablo, about the legislative process at the Colombian Senate on the anti slap legislation uh, when we have um, our session of Q&As. Um, for now, I'll pass the floor to Pedro Cárdenas, our last speaker, uh, for his initial uh, introduction, initial presentation. Uh, Pedro is Protection Coordinator at Article 19 uh, and have been, has been studying uh, slaps and reporting on slaps for the last uh, five or six years in Mexico. Uh, Pedro, you have the floor. Thank you to the Justice for Journalists Foundation and the Center of Foreign Policy for generating this fantastic conversation today. And thank you so much for inviting Article 19 to speak on the situation of Mexico. Now, very briefly, as a matter of introduction, for those that don't know Article 19, we're an international non-governmental organization focused on freedom of expression and fight against censorship. Our headquarters are in London, and the Mexico and Central America office has been working since the year 2006. Now, in Mexico, we focus uh, on different subjects, digital rights, right to access to information, that is to say the right to, the right to know, and uh, as well the protection for journalists. Now, why protection for journalists? Mexico continues to be considered one of the most dangerous countries to exercise journalism. The reason for this is that since the year 2000, at least 145 journalists have been murdered linked to their potential research or investigations. In this regard, Article 19 also documents the daily harassment, threats, and attacks that uh, journalists live uh, in our country. In this case, uh, from January to July of 2021, we documented an attack against the press at least every 12 hours. That is to say, twice a day, a journalist is harassed in Mexico because of their work. Now, in this context, how does strategic lawsuit for, uh, against public participation happen? How do slaps happen? Um, slaps are increasingly used to undermine the efforts of journalists working and investigating corruption, and that is to say the misuse of funds by the government, the lack of transparency by the government, and links between public actors, private actors, and of course de facto power groups such as those pertaining to organized crime. How is this happening? Like many other countries uh, that we'll be talking around today, Mexico also has these so-called crimes against honor or offenses against honor. Now, in Mexico, these are handled mostly by the states. Uh, we have a federal system, so the states are the ones that uh, modify this uh, criminal or civil code in accordance to their own territory. So it might be named uh, rights against honor, uh, rights pertaining to reputation, uh, defamation, etc. They might be slightly different on each state, but the situation is the same. These are all being abused uh, and used as a chilling effect against journalists. That is to say, these are lawsuits that are being used against journalists for the simple fact that they're investigating and their investigation is being categorized as an attack. How dire is the situation? Well, we've seen a huge increase since the year 2015. In 2015, Article 19 just documented one such case of these type of lawsuits. However, one year later, we documented 13. Um, in 2018, we documented 21. In 2019, the number was repeated. Last year, we documented up to 39 cases. And this year, we are currently at 21 of these lawsuits, out of which uh, they're both uh, criminal law and civil law. However, there's an addition to this particular year, which is the use, uh, or rather the misuse, of the electoral law. Now, we had midterm elections this year, and in at least eight different situations, uh, ca political candidates started legal procedures against journalists, accusing them of political violence or even specifically uh, political gendered violence. So when specifically pertaining to uh, women candidates. Now, these lawsuits, the ones that we have documented at Article 19, are misuses and abuses of these legislation in regards that an investigation by journalists cannot simply be categorized as an attack 
uh, against you know honor or an attack against uh, even even in terms of by in terms of political violence. So in this regard, there's also the concern of other types of legislations that are being used. Now this pattern is so clear and so obvious that there is already a fear within the journalistic community to receive these lawsuits. We need to understand that the majority of journalists do not have even the basic uh, labor social security standards that most other uh, that most other offices and professions have. So in this regard, uh, since 2018, Article 19 has documented at least a dozen threats of legal action against journalists. That is to say, the effect is so chilling that it no longer is needed to start the full procedure in the slap, but also that slaps are so known nowadays that I can even just threaten journalists that I will do it as a way to silence them and to stop the investigation. When we're considering this whole situation, the chilling effect on freedom of expression is very dire in Mexico because we're considering that journalists are being, to, are being forced to go under these procedures legally, whether the criminal laws or civil laws, or even the electoral ones, in the terms that they can no longer handle the huge amount of paperwork, economic resources, and time that will be used. And so the fear for journalists is that they won't be able to continue their investigations because there might be use uh, they might use they might have the legislation being used against them thank you so much great thank you very much pedro and uh welcome all of you now i think we're all live uh on on the same platform so very nice to to see you all uh, thank you pedro for for your presentation and for highlighting this new aspect of the use of the electoral law against journalists who report critically on on candidates or a specific political party. Uh, this is something that we're observing uh, as well in Brazil, uh, exactly the same type of, of lawsuit, which has to be dealt with in a very expedient way by the courts. So uh, it's being used to, to suppress uh, critical reporting and avoid um, uh, any any attempt at transparency and accountability by, by these candidates. So thank you very much for highlighting that and also the experience of Article 19 in Mexico with so many threats and such a, a huge number of cases and, uh, and lawsuits that you're following um, against journalists in the country. Um, just a, a note now for those uh, who are uh, participating in this conf in the conference. Um, if you have questions, please um, type them on the Q&A box uh, on Zoom and the organizers will pass them on to us so, or to me so I can read them to, to, our, to our panelists. So whilst you do that, I have, uh, first of all, a couple of questions to, to Morgan. We'll, we'll do it in, in order of, of appearance. Uh, Morgan, uh, thank you for, for your presentation and you know, our solidarity uh, to you on, on your, your uh, huge uh, lawsuits that you're facing and uh, good luck in the appeals. Uh, my question to you is about um, how did you go about finding representation uh, in, in this case? Was this something that you were familiar with? Um, were you familiar with these sorts of strategies or, or tactics uh, by, by big businesses or, or corporations to try and silence activists and journalists? Um. Thanks for having me. Um, finding counsel was incredibly stressful. It was uh, some of the the worst uh, part of the process. And um, you know, you made reference to this being a, a big lawsuit. I, I uh, neglected to mention in the video, they sued me, claiming both both me personally and my company, um, saying I'd caused as much as sixty million U.S. dollars of damage. Um, it, you know, so it means most of the time I'm walking around my house going, gee, I really like living here, you know, <laughs> hope I get to keep it. Um, so um, from that perspective, the the psychic stress um, of essentially if they were to prevail to lose my home, my business, everything I have um, uh, was massive. Um, and then the other thing to note is that the the model under which I write as an independent contractor I don't get any coverage or protection 
Um, I'll note that I've had a remarkable amount of support um, in terms of uh, the media company uh, signing amicus briefs um, alongside CNN, LA Times, even Fox News, um, Hearst Corporation. You know, there's been a massive amount of support, which I've really appreciated. Um, but that's very different than actually having legal support. And that meant basically having to um, very aggressively fight with insurance companies um, and their hourly rates, which uh, sometimes can imply you're supposed to, you know, call a lawyer off a billboard, um, as opposed to what it would take to really fight a sixty million dollar lawsuit. Um, and uh, basically, I would say it, it took a lot of. Uh, investigating because you also you don't have a lot of time um, before having to file that initial defense. Um, so identifying who was the right lawyer for this type of work and um, begging, a lot of begging. Um, and actually, another kind of interesting part in the intersection of our stories, I've been living in Brazil uh, in the winters the last uh, eight years running. Um, I, there's a long story connected to that, but um, the wife of the lead counsel is Brazilian. So I basically kept offering to drive over with Cachaça and Pau de Queijo and do whatever I had to do to convince this lawyer that he needed to represent me um, and eventually did. And I think the other, um, I mean, I, I, um, I wouldn't say that I used this, but I would say um, that it, it's, still, it's still hard for me to talk about family separation. Um, it's really hard for me to talk about it without crying because it, um, it's just so terrible to think that we did that to people, um, that we continue to do that to people. And I think that any lawyer um, in the U.S., you know, with with any sense of a heart and conscience is happy to fight back against family separation. Um, so from that perspective, uh, Davis Wright Tremaine, who has been just so uh, wonderful with their time in defense, um, I think legitimately did care about how do we make sure that this chapter of American history is really brought to light uh, in the way that it deserves and all the for-profit actors who made money off of those families. I mean, it's just, it's just, um, it's, it's bad enough to have done it in the first place. Um, but to think that part of your business strategy was to say, let's make money off of separated families, um, just it, it, even as a, a business person, right, is, is just unbelievably offensive. Um, so I'll, I'll go ahead and stop there. Um, but yes, finding counsel was extremely challenging. Um, I'm thrilled to have it. And I'm thrilled to now know that there are more organizations out there that do provide support. Uh, but even then, I found that uh, some were it basically, given that it's multi-year lawsuits, it does take a really big commitment um, to support people in this way. Great, thank you very much. And do you think that the, the general public, someone asked the question, the general public is aware of the legal risks uh, faced by uh, journalists in the United States? Oh, certainly not. Uh, I, I was not aware, <laughs> you know, which shame on me. Um, but it also goes back to there's a lot of people who are writing. Uh, so so one, one thing to make abundantly clear, I'm not a journalist. I'm not a trained journalist by any stretch of the imagination. I am a, con a senior contributor to Forbes.com. We write about the things we know. We're tapped for our expertise in business um, across different types of markets. I write about money and social justice. Um, I basically do it because it's an opportunity uh, to be able to share messages with the world that people need to hear, like your money was funding family separation, right? Um, so I think people in general uh, in, in don't even necessarily have to be a journalist um, to have their words um, taken in, in such a way um, that beyond even talking about the statutory uh, requirements around defamation or malice, and I would say kind of similar in Jean Paulo's case, if someone has an ax to grind, they're gonna find you. Um, and that it, 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 it the, the law um, is, is somewhat irrelevant in that case. And, and I, I would hope there's not a judge in the US that would uh, say that prisons don't separate families, right? <laughs> that, um, and, and one of the things in the amicus brief that was just filed by all those uh, media organizations, they specifically pointed to saying uh, that my um, writing was truthful. Um, mm -hmm. Truth is often irrelevant in these cases. Um, and mm -hmm. I think that's where, the element of risk of just expressing an opinion 
um, is so massive. And um, people may know in the U.S., we just had this massive verdict, um, the trial of Kyle Rittenhouse, who had uh, murdered um, three uh, protesters, um, you know, with an, an AR-15 um, in self-defense, one of whom had thrown a plastic bag at him. Um, and just the idea that expressing public opinion in America um, has become so fraught that we are so unable to resolve conflict through words um, that we're either extremely conflict of avoidant, particularly white American culture, or we go straight to the gun. Um, and there's just not a lot of, of space in between. That to me is a frightening trend, uh, trend even beyond uh, the particulars of lawsuits, but just of, of freedom of expression and, and the ability to have healthy conflict in society. Mm. Great, thank you very much, Morgan. Um, th there, there, there are a couple more questions that came through, but I'll come back to, to you uh, once I've done a first round with, with everyone else. Thank you. Uh, now a question for you, Cuenca. Uh, you, you're facing 140 lawsuits. Uh, obviously, you need uh, uh, lawyers to, to be able to defend yourself on, on, on this amount of, of cases. Um, can you just talk a little bit about that and also the, the, the situation, the case, one of the cases where a judge, uh, even though the claim was obviously uh, frivolous and uh, pointless, uh, the judge, uh, without hearing you, your defense, uh, ordered your Twitter account to be closed. Well, first of all, good evening, everyone. Uh, I totally identify with, with Morgan in, in concerning the struggle about finding counseling. Uh, my first contact was with uh, a lawyer in Rio. Uh, and after some, after more or less six months, we got the, the, the support of media defense, which was key for me to be able to sleep because uh, it's not only 143 uh, lawsuits, but they asked for in total uh, one million and five hundred thousand reais, which is more than I will ever get in my bank account in the next decades. So, <laughs> I believe so. So it, it it was it was really difficult in the middle of the a pandemic. Uh, so I, I I always thank Media Defense for that. Uh, they are using I don't know if it's. It's everywhere, everywhere in the world like this. But in Brazil, we created in the in the in the nineties uh, some so special civil courts, and those courts were were made for poor people, poor plaintiffs, uh, to 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 complain against large corporations. Like if you buy a refrigerator and then you don't get the refrigeration in your small town, in the middle of the Amazon. So you 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 go to the, one of those special courts. And then the, this big company had have to defend itself in the small town. So it's 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 a very it's a, a nice idea to to balance uh, 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 the system. But in the last in the last years, it's been it's been used in a complete in a complete dishonest way. It's a misdemeanor litigation. It's everywhere. Uh, I, I was researching. I became a sort of a specialist in the in the matter. Uh, the first case that got a media in Brazil was more than ten years ago. Do you know Mutantes, that that great band, Brazilian band from the sixties, seventies? Rita Lee, yeah. the lead singer of Mutantes, and a, a group of policemen start beating some 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 boys who were smoking pot. Uh, so and she started to complain against the policeman and. She, she said some nasty things about police. It happens, you know. Anyone who, who heard hip hop or anything or like that knows what it is like to be in a, in a concert and listen to uh, a lead singer talking, trashing police. So, but but in the next w months, uh, more than forty policemen use those special civil courts in a coordinate action against Italy. And then she tweeted something, and then they went against her in Twitter. And in Brazil, it's sort of a—it's a matter of luck, you know. Uh, we already won 
70 litigations, there's more than 70. Uh, but if you get a, a judge who is, I don't know, an evangelical or uh, he's, he's an ex policeman, I don't know, he can, he really lost a lot of money on that. Uh, and then Elvira Lobato also got pro prosecuted by 111 pastors from the same church uh, I'm, I'm, I'm being chased after. So it's it's getting it's being it's becoming the new normal in Brazil. And Carlos, I, 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 I guess I mentioned to you there is a congressman here who is trying to to pass a, a bill about uh, slaps in Brazil. And I think this is urgent everywhere. Yeah, it is definitely. Thank you very much, Cuenca. Um, someone asked, some, someone from the audience asks if you've been in touch with all the journalists who have been sued by the, the Universal Church uh, in Brazil yeah. or in Europe as well. Um, they suggest it could be a good uh, strategy sharing um, idea. Yeah, I talked a lot with Elvira Lobato, the, one, the, the other big case here in Brazil. Uh, and actually, I feel a little embarrassed to talk with, with Elvira because she's a real journalist. I'm a writer and a columnist. I was writing columns against Bolsonaro in Dosha Valley before they fired me. And but Elvira, she's a real journalist. She she she, she made she made a, a big piece on, on the Universal Church. And I was just writing satire. I'm I'm being chased after because of a because of a, a, a metaphor, because of of language. <laughs> But she, mm -hmm. she, 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 she was prosecuted because of work, of real work. And she wasn't even, uh, they, they weren't like uh, complaining about anything she, she wrote because all, all her piece was correct. She was writing about the, the, the money of the church and the investments of the church and how many uh, radio and TV stations the church had, and et cetera. All the correct. But there was just say she was being defamated by her. And actually, Elvira gave up on journalism. She mm -hmm. she she retired like uh, 10, 20 years before because she was so disenchanted by the, this episode that she, she gave up. And what I'm to do is sort of the opposite. I'm trying to make something out of it to create some sort of dialogue. So I'm I'm writing a book about this. I'm trying to, to raise funds to make a film about this, trying to have a conversation in good faith with the, some of those pastors to m more than to talk to to listen and, and to to understand how is their life how the church is, is important for for that society in that small town uh, every, everywhere in brazil because i feel this conversation is not being being held in brazil and it's very important That's that's great, uh, Quinka. Thank you very much. That's that's very very generous of you to 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 be trying to engage with with those who are suing you and uh, are making your life so miserable and so difficult to try and understand the process and why this is happening. That's very very eloquent. Uh, we have a, a question for the the three Latin Americans, um, which is uh, considering the social and legal context in Latin America. Uh, what can we do to prevent the use of slaps and support people facing them? And to that, if, you, if I may, I would uh, ask uh, Juan Pablo and Pedro um, about the legislative initiatives uh, ongoing in Colombia and if there's any in Mexico. Cuenca just mentioned in Brazil a, a very initial draft bill. Uh, in Colombia, it's more advanced. I understand FLIP. Uh, participated in a public hearing and gave testimony in, in the discussion of, of the draft law in, in the Senate. So could you talk to us a little bit more about these um, uh, legislative initiatives? And, and as it was uh, asked by someone in the audience, what we can do uh, to, to prevent and support journalists who face these slaps? Sure. Oh, Pablo, yeah, you... first of all. Yeah. <laughs> Good evening to all the panelists. First of all, my solidarity to Morgan and, and Joe Paulo. Uh, if we're going to speak about the, the ongoing um, proposal of, of a anti slap bill in Colombia, uh, it's, it's a very brief proposal which introduces some reforms 
on the civil procedure code and the criminal code. Uh, this works similar to how it works in some anti-slap laws all over the world, uh, in California, for example, uh, by giving the judge tools to order an anticipated termination of the process or an anticipated sentence uh, in the civil cases or in the criminal procedures. Uh, it gives tools to uh, order the, the action to be archived, uh, which essentially means the same, the, the action to be terminated on the basis of it being a, a, a tool used to silence a freedom of expression. This applies to journalists, but it also applies to human rights defenders, as, as we made uh, evident uh, recently in a work we, we published alongside Article 19 in Mexico about uh, slaps in Mexico and Colombia. So this, this bill has, it, it has not been uh, debated with the urgency we think it needs. We, if we went to a public hearing uh, to expose and hear some of the journalists uh, which have been slapped in Colombia in recent years. And recently the bill passed the first debate, uh, but we are only less than a month uh, until the legislature in Colombia finishes. So I don't think that uh, the bill will, will pass in, in these few, few weeks. Uh, we hope that this will be reinstated in the next legislature, but I, I don't have a, a very optimistic approach to it. And what we see from the congressmen and congresswomen in Colombia is that some of them have like uh, prejudice against press. They think that these bills uh, are a way of limiting access to justice, but by no means it's a limitation to the access to justice, but a guarantee for journalists and human rights defenders to denounce and do their, their job the right way without the, the pressure that signifies uh, lawsuits in all of spheres of life, uh, as I think that Morgan and, and Joe Paulo made evident. And as for what can the people do to prevent slaps or support journalists, I think that unfortunately there's not much people can effectively do because they can't be a lawyer and defend the, the journalists, but they can visibilize what's going on. They can... Uh, help us uh, in the discussions and, and these spaces that, that are happening right now in this conference are fundamental to visibilize that this is not uh, a problem in Colombia, in the United States, in Brazil, in Mexico, but it is a problem all over the world. So I think the constant visibilization and the work of the, the organizations such as Media Defense, such as FLIP, such as uh, Article 19 are fundamental in order to achieve something to tackle this threat against freedom of expression. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Juan Pablo. Yeah, I, I was a bit more hopeful on, on this, uh, the initiative in Colombia, but yeah, your, your assessment is, is very sober and uh, knowledgeable about it. And the, the short period of time to the end of the legislature is, is uh, it's very difficult. You're right. Um, Pedro, what's your take on that, um, on legislative initiatives in Mexico and uh, what to do uh, to face this threat? Yeah, thank you, Carlos. And again, thank you, everybody, for their time here. Um, I would say, you know, I echo Juan Pablo's sentiments uh, completely. You know, the situation in Mexico, I would say instead of getting better, it has become more complicated with the pandemic. One thing that we noticed is that uh, with the COVID, with the COVID nineteen pandemic, there were a lot of small um, state level initiatives to, uh, and I quote, fight misinformation or fight fake news. But the definition of misinformation or fake news is pretty much set by the government. So in reality, these there was even one um, there was even one uh, law initiative that uh, by the in Puebla that even defined you know contradicting government you know as a as a way to um, 
stop misinformation. So in that sense, even the pandemic has uh, given us another wave of other potential legislations that might actually harm or affect uh, journalists in Mexico in that regard. So that is also very complicated. I would say one thing that is definitely needed is a small point that uh, Morgan stated is that, you know, her contract didn't have this, uh, uh, the, the legal defense as part of it. And I would say, you know, most journalists in Mexico, and I'm sure uh, elsewhere, will have that very similar situation in that they will not have any legal representation other than the one given by the state. And the state itself is most of the times the one that is harassing them. So that actually that disparity is very complicated. So in that regard, one thing that is very important is that I would say, you know, journalists are always looking for, you know, organizations that are looking to 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 defend them, uh, uh, lawyer initiatives, uh, any funds that they could use to hire uh, a lawyer is always an important situation because the fact is they keep asking organizations like FLIP, or, uh, Juan Pablo I'm sure knows all about this and, and Article 19 in Mexico, but the situation is there's so many cases that we're unable to take them all. And at one point we can just, you know, like we'll give you legal recommendations, but you're gonna have to do this more or less on your own sphere. And that is always a huge complication, particularly for journalists that might be uh, independent freelance journalists uh, or journalists that might not be living precisely, you know, in the big uh, capital uh, where they might have even less uh, opportunities to fight the situation. So I, I, I also have this very sober view. I'm sorry, Carlos. Um, but the fact is, you know, we have been working on it a certain extent. Um, the, the Mexican Supreme Court has already called for the decriminalization of these uh, crimes or offenses against honor. So in that regard, uh, one thing that organizations like Article 19 have been working in Mexico is state by state uh, trying to use the Amparo writ, which is a tip, uh, it's a typical writ in Mexico to, to defend uh, constitutionally against a violation of your rights to be little by little eliminating them state by state. And it's a harrowing process and it takes years, but, you know, there is still a lot to work and uh, there's still a lot of, you know, pushback against it. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, it's it's a long journey. And thank you very much for the work you do uh, from Pablo and Pedro, Flip and, and Article 19 for taking on uh, this fight, um, you know, case by case, uh, state by state, or province by province, it's it's a it's a tough, tough process. Um, and and this, I think, you you just mentioned. I'm, I'm going to mention something that uh, uh, we do as well, which is uh, capacity building of lawyers, because as you say, sometimes uh, a public defender or even a, a lawyer is not trained in media law and freedom of expression, on on the standards that should be observed. Uh, when you're talking about uh, uh, journalism, um, public interest work, like uh, what, uh, what an NGO or, or, or a charity does. Um, so the, the sort of capacity building, training of lawyers to, in, to be able to engage um, meaningfully with the courts on, in this area is something that we do, uh, as well as many other organizations. But this is a gap that we see in, in not only Latin America, but in, in many other countries uh, where more lawyers um, could be trained and could uh, uh, be skillful, um, get those skills uh, in order to litigate uh, more efficiently. Um, I'll go back to that question then um, to Morgan. Uh, so Morgan, um, Mona Dili asks, uh, if the suit stopped or intervening, intervened with the work of Candid uh, in following the money, and what risk assessment or preventative measures uh, did they take uh, before the lawsuit, or did you take any, or are you taking uh, any measures now uh, after being you've been sued? Sure. So um, we certainly haven't stopped, um, and I think that's the kind of funny nature of this, right? That uh, you try to shut an activist up and we just come back harder. So unfortunately, uh, yeah, that strategy failed on their behalf. The difference is that now um, there's kind of two lawyers that sit on my shoulder every time that I speak. Um, 
that I just have everything so thoroughly vetted in what we do, um, every tweet, I mean, everything. Um, at the same time, and this goes back to the nefarious nature um, of lawfare, I'm gonna adopt that term, um, that literally, once again, I could have had five lawyers vet my article and no one would have told you that prisons uh, separate families is an untrue statement, right? So uh, to some degree, there's only so much you can do when people aspire to bend the truth. The lawyers that support my work help ensure that I've uh, correctly cited all my statements, that I'm clear on what's a fact and what's an opinion. I mean, these pieces that are, um, pretty basic, but they, from that perspective, they don't really protect you if someone is really trying to go out of their way to invent an excuse to attack you. Um, so from that perspective, um, I continue and and um, everyone that I work with, um, sure, to um, take on some degree of risk, but um, at the risk of being uh, a little Pollyanna about it, there's a huge risk to not speaking out. Um, and that that's what I have to focus on. I mean, I want to go back to there are 500 kids that are still looking for their parents. That's a huge risk. Um, so I, I think that's where we kind of just have to keep our eyes on the prize of doing this work, which is trying to build a safer, um, more just world. Um, and yes, you can try to prevent um, these, but that's where I think the really the legal frameworks um, become so important in terms of what sort of protections are there on the front end. Um, what's the ability to ensure that if these fights do happen, because I do think um, fighting for the truth, trying to determine the truth is a really important societal endeavor um, on a certain level. And, and certainly we've seen in the US that um, in instances where hate speech is allowed to uh, perpetuate at the highest levels, you wind up with things like January 6th. Um, so I think it is important for us to um, to still be aware of how speech is going to impact society and who says it, um, but being more conscious about who has real power um, behind those words as well um, makes a big difference. Uh, but, but more specific to the question, we absolutely haven't stopped. Um, and and the, the other piece that I would say has been critical to our work from the beginning, I, I wanna be clear that it wasn't just Morgan Simon and Candy Group that was fighting family separation. We were part of a coalition where over 500,000 people took action across the country. And that's why you had close to 90% of the bank financing decide to pull out, right? This is not just me kind of getting up wildly. Um, I, I would say that the other major protection that we have is the power of social movements, um, that I'm, I'm never doing this work alone. You know, I'm doing this very broadly um, within coalitions across the US, um, and that to some degree, we have the ability to protect each other um, just as much as we get the support of, of lawyers and, and other resources. Thank you very much, Morgan. That's, uh, that you're very right. You, you have to fight for what you believe. Um, and now linking to what you're saying on social movements and, and the power of social movements, I, I wanted to just get the opinion from, from Pedro, Juan Pablo and, and Cuenca. Um, Cuenca, you mentioned you're, you're making uh, fundraising to produce a film, to have a dialogue with those who are harassing you. Um, Pedro and Juan Pablo, what do you think about the public perception? You know, earlier I asked Morgan if the American public uh, is aware of the risks uh, that journalists or activists face uh, because of their work. Um, how, how do you think people can raise awareness and how can people help? How can uh, solidarity uh, be created or generated uh, to support um, journalists or activists, whoever is uh, at the end of, of a SLAPS lawsuit. Right, I should choose one to, to begin. So, Pedro, why don't you go first? Thank you, Carlos. Um, I would say, you know, are people aware of the situation in Mexico? Yes. Uh, to an extent. Uh, however, like I mentioned at the beginning of my intro, a lot of the situations happening in Mexico have to do with um, physical violence or lethal violence in the cases of murders, disappearances, and other types of situations. So in Mexico, the situation of slaps 
sort of within the public context has taken a, a step backward in the sense that people might not be aware of it, uh, how dangerous it is in silencing so many voices at the same time. Uh, because of course, you know, there's a lot of other situations going on. So I would say, you know, what we can do at least on the, on the Mexican situation to begin with on when we're speaking about if we're outside of Mexico, for those of you that are, you know, in other countries and either in, in Europe and in, in UK or uh, in the US is uh, there can always be public pressure on the Mexican authorities to actually do their work. So one of the things that is most dire in Mexico is the impunity levels. When we're talking about cases uh, against journalists, these cases, uh, these slaps actually move way faster than the cases that journalists themselves are having or than the investigations for any situation that journalists is having. So. There's, a, there's actually the creation of a special prosecutor uh, in Mexico that uh, specializes on um, crimes and offenses against freedom of expression and journalists. And that one, all the cases that it has taken, only 2% um, of them have actually had a sentence. So we have a 98% impunity rate in Mexico. So outside of Mexico, one thing that we definitely need to work on is the fact that you know justice cannot be partial, justice cannot just uh, have a, an expedited feature when it is against journalists and then have a perpetual standby, you know, have journalists and the families of journalists who have been murdered, for instance, wait over 20, 30 years without a single news of what actually happened to their family members. So I think there, there's a lot of pressure that can be put on the government, particularly on impunity. And uh, within Mexico, we definitely need to, uh, keep working and uh, this is one of the campaigns that article 19 mexico is working with a coalition of organizations on the importance of journalism journalism is part of the democratic ecosystem and we need journalists to gain access to information to fulfill our right to know so that is sort of like another sort of uh set of uh important situation that we're working on because particularly uh, the mexican government has taken a very similar uh, position as you know the previous U.S. government in attacking journalists and uh, identifying any information that contradicts the authorities as as fake news. You know it's a it's a very stigmatizing process, and in that regard, journalists are seen now as an adversary that is you know plotting with the high elites uh, to attack you know this government. Even Article 19 has been mentioned as part of this uh, you know. Uh, evil coalition that is uh, supposedly trying to to fight the government where we've been working in in this country since 2006 and uh, in that regard it's important to focus on the dialogue that journalists uh, have a right to investigate but that by doing so they fulfill my right as a citizen to gain access to information that is not only going to be the official one but a variety plural ideas, different ideas, opposing ideas, even ideas that might make me uncomfortable. That is, you know, freedom of expression. And that's where we're working on as well. And that's something very important that needs to be worked on. That's great. Thank you very much, Pedro. Um, I, I think from, from what you mentioned, I'll pass it on to, to Juan Paulo uh, Cuenca. Well, Juan Pablo, Juan Paulo. So Cuenca, uh, because uh, Pedro's description of Mexico, you know, could be pretty much applied to, to Brazil in the context you're living in, right? Yeah, I guess so. It's, uh, and I, I feel we have to publicize it more and the, the, the initial reaction of, of everyone is to, to be afraid. You know, when I tweeted that and all, all that came after, some people started to print because I del deleted the, print, the, the tweet some, like half an hour after but they, they were already printed. So a lot of people on my side, not a lot, a few people on my side, they, they did a print of the tweet. And they, they started to share it and say, let's all share because then we can all get prosecuted and that threatened and that's, let's create this. And almost no one did it <laughs> because they were really scared to be prosecuted because of a satire of a metaphor that has been made by hundreds of thousands of writers and, and uh, 
in in the in the uh, long Island history. So, uh, and this this sort of of state, I guess it has been normalized in the last years. You know, when Elvira Lobato was prosecuted by the church in two thousand seven, Lula, Lula, you know that Lula, in a, in an interview, he said, "Oh, the journalists they." They must take uh, accountability. They must be responsible about what they write. The Vira piece was perfect. She wasn't lying or creating anything against the church. She was just passing information. And then the president of Brazil at that time, because he, he had the, the church as a, an ally or a political, in his political alliance, the church was very important to him, as it is important to Bolsonaro. And then he, he the president says something like this. So it's a tragedy that is composed. It's, it's, it has been made by many hands, even in our side, even in the left wing. You know, that's what I feel. Great. Thank you very much, Cuenca. And uh, Juan Pablo, what, what's, what's your view on, on what uh, it's, has been said and uh, from the Colombian perspective on solidarity and raising awareness uh, on this issue uh, by the public? Okay, I think my my assessment is very similar to the one of Pedro in Mexico. I think we, we have a lot of similarities, similar contexts in our countries. And first of all, uh, I think that raising awareness about slaps is a bit harder in a country where, where you're talking constantly about death threats, uh, murders, uh, armed conflict. Uh, but I, I think we have advanced on that topic significantly. Uh, I have an example that, that I think illustrates so very well this is Juan Pablo Arrientos, who I spoke about in the video when he published his first book, which was called in English, Let the Kids Come to Me. Uh, in 2019, there was a precautionary measure that, that was instated by a, a judge uh, that was absurd and against freedom of expression that it ordered to for it to be unpublished and for the printing to be stopped when this was made public uh, juan paulo told me that it was like the it was the best promotion of their book because the, it happened and then social media campaigns uh, for for the book to be uh, Bugged, uh, so censorship in this case, fortunately, exponentially amplified the message that Juan Pablo was trying to give. No, uh, and I think that's the best tool we have nowadays is uh, amplifying these messages that are being censored. We have now the 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 big advantage of having social media, uh, sometimes uh, on our favor. And yeah, I think that uh, people can, can really help to raise awareness and to visibilize what's going on massively. And sometimes censorship has the, the opposite effect on, on the public debate, no? because it, it opens the public debate about those issues that are being censored. Right. Thank you very much, Juan Pablo. Yeah, we're, we're reaching the end of our, of our panel. We have one minute. Um, so I think I'll uh, take the opportunity to thank uh, our four speakers, uh, Morgan, Juan Pablo, Juan Paulo, and Pedro, for, for your uh, interventions. I think it was fascinating, and uh, I learned a lot from, from what you, you said today. I hope those who are attending the, the session have as well. I uh, just wanted to say that if you're interested in SLAPS um, and want to learn more and want more references, the conference has set up a, a, a website where you can have, we can find a section dedicated to resource, SLAP resources. Uh, the website is anti slash slapconference.info. Uh, but if you signed up to this, you'll probably receive an email with that uh, information. And uh, feel free to, to uh, check our websites, uh, Candid's website, FLIPS, Article 19's uh, Media Defenses, uh, Jean Paulo's. Uh, uh, writings uh, in Brazil and hopefully uh, elsewhere as well. And there's a final comment from uh, Mona Dili asking uh, whether it would be a good idea to set up legal aid funds um, 
or uh, fund, fund, fundraise to defend against labs nationally or internationally. And I think that is something that's a great idea. Uh, legal aid should be provided by the state, uh, in my view. And many countries do have uh, um, public defenders who, who provide uh, essential legal defense uh, for those who can't afford a lawyer. So um, many, oftentimes, as uh, I think Juan Pablo or Pedro mentioned, uh, journalists uh, don't have all the, the protections, um, the labor protections from, from an employee, like social security, pension, uh, and protection from their employers. Uh, many times they're freelancers, so uh, they don't have uh, means to pay for, for this. So that's an excellent idea. And fundraising for that, I think there's, there's um, a critical uh, thinking growing in, in this area. This conference is a proof uh, of the efforts by civil society organizations to raise awareness uh, about this issue, connect people, connect those who are uh, already providing defense, providing funds and legal defense. And I think we can move forward from this. I think maybe in a year or two, we'll hopefully we'll be much better positioned to, to be helping uh, public actors uh, defend themselves against slaps uh, in their countries. So with that, thank you very much again uh, to Justice for Journalists and uh, the Foreign Policy Center for organizing this fantastic conference and have a good afternoon. Bye.